So in this video, we're going to talk about penistome parasites in snakes, and specifically an invasive exotic species, Reliatella orientalis, which has moved into Florida and now is spreading northward up the Florida Peninsula and probably will soon enter much of the southeastern United States. I'm Terry Farrell, and I'll be with Jenna Pomisano here talking about pentastomes. This is a pygmy rattlesnake from central Florida, and it shows signs of another major conservation threat, snake fungal disease. So you can see that infected eye. But this snake has far larger problems than simply snake fungal disease. It died soon after we took video of it, and we collected this specimen, did a necropsy, and you can see that it has large numbers of parasitic crustaceans. They are penistome parasites. Hi, this is Jenna. As Terry said, these are pentastome crustaceans within the lungs of a pygmy rattlesnake. And the species that we are pulling out of the lungs that is loosely embedded is Relitella orientalis. Up next, we can see Relitella orientalis in the lungs of a black racer. You can see that the larger pentastomes here are likely the females and the smaller ones are the males. Unlike Burmese pythons, who are speculated to have spilt over this parasite into native snake populations, the females and the male penistomes get quite large, much bigger than in the pythons, and the intensity of infection is much greater as well. Here's an example of just how large Relitella orientalis females can get. This one is about 80 millimeters. This one was pulled from a dead pygmy rattlesnake, and it reaches about 72 millimeters. This microscopic image gives us a great look at the flattened and triangular head of Relitella orientalis, which makes its morphology distinct from the native snake pentastomes. Pentastomes have these hook-like appendages throughout their life stages as an embryonated egg, at all larval forms, and at all adult forms. RO looks different from two native species of penistome parasites that infect snakes. And you can see on this specimen of RO, it's got a very flattened head, and it's actually kind of a very elongate, thin animal that's less than a millimeter wide. Um, and the two native species, Porocephalus and Chirocephalus, often have very different head morphology and are thicker. RO has the propensity to move out of the lungs and into the trachea and out of the mouth of the snake once the snake dies. We can see this here in a southern black racer from Seminole County that had a live penistome crawling out of its mouth actively. So many species are develop RO infections in central Florida now, and that includes most of the abundant and widespread groups of snakes in North America, including rat snakes, rattlesnakes, garter snakes, black racers, coach whips, uh, water snakes in the genus Nerodia, and so a whole bunch of different species of snakes are known to carry RO, and that list keeps growing. We've recently, and as have other researchers, found RO in coral snakes scarlet king snakes, ribbon snakes, and mud snakes. And so this is a very dangerous conservation threat because it infects so many different species of snakes and often has really high parasite intensity, a lot of pentastomes per host. So to start dissections, we usually start from the vent and we make a superficial cut on the ventrum. So we usually insert the scissors under a ventral scale, and again, we're kind of pulling up down the midline as we're cutting, not to um, get into the body cavity too much. And we will cut all the way to the top through the mouth. But to start, when we're looking at dead animals, we're always checking the mouth because these parasites do have the propensity to move out of the mouth. So we check the mouth first before we start dissecting. Once we have created that cut up the ventrum, we start to pull apart a little bit. So we look in the trachea um, second because often you can see Relitella orientalis uh, gets stuck in there. So once we've inspected the mouth and the trachea, we're going to move down the body. 
Here's the heart there. And what we do is we pinch the edges of the first incision that we made and we pull apart the body cavity gently so that we can visualize straight through the peritoneum to see if there are any adults visible. Then we'll start to cut into the peritoneum so that we can expose the lungs. This is where we are likely to find most of the individuals of an infected snake. This is where the penostomes are feeding on the blood and where they are often causing lesions and sometimes pneumonia. So here you can see where the trachea is at the top of the lung. Further back, you can see some smaller parasites. The males are quite small relative to the larger females. This banded water snake is a very heavy infection. And while the parasites are often in the anterior part of the lung, when you cut back and look at the vascularized region of the lung, that's the interior part, you'll see some worms, but often you want to look further back too. Raleotella orientalis tends to be very loosely attached inside the host, and so you can see as they're being picked up with these forceps, it's very easy to pull them out. Um, one of the species we'll talk about later, Curacephalus, tends to actually bore through the lung and then firmly attach to tissue, and it takes some tugging to remove, unlike these. As Terry said, this banded water snake has an intense infection. This is not surprising as we find a lot of native snakes with Raleigh-Taylor orientalis infections that include more than a hundred adults. Here's a pygmy rattlesnake. Um, in its lung, you can see a small penistome parasite. It's RO, and that's a male. And in the same specimen, you can see the male outside the snake now. You can see some much larger individuals. Those are the reproductive females. Well, here we have another banded water snake, and this one actually has examples of the Curacephalus coarctatus, the native pentastome. These are the ones that Terry was speaking on, uh, speaking about that kind of really bore into the lungs. They have a super bulbous head, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and they tend to be a lot thicker than RO individuals. So we're cutting into the lung here to expose the adult penostomes. It's always nice to use a good sharp pair of dissection scissors to make these superficial cuts easy. Now we've exposed one of the adult Curacephalus coarctatus. Curacephalus coarctatus is often found in these banded water snakes as well as other water snakes and indigo snakes as they use fish as an intermediate host. Here we can see how well Curacephalus coarctatus adults attach themselves to the lungs. They're much harder to detach than Raleigh-Taylor orientalis. In these photographs, you can see Curacephalus and one of the things that's very clear about it is that it's got a much more bulbous head, a thinner neck-like region. These are often inserted into the host tissue. The hooks, which will be visual under a good dissecting scope, are in a straight horizontal line across the front of that bulbous head, as opposed to in Raleigh-Atella having two forward and two back. Um, and so there's a variety of ways in which they morphologically appear quite different than Raleigh-Atella. Often the annulations on the body, the segmentation, is more clear on Curacephalus than RO. We're going to look at the, the other native snake penistome, Porocephalus crotali, which often moves into snakes through the mammal intermediate host. Here we're getting an idea of the nice vascularized lung of this cottonmouth and a big female Porocephalus crotali. This cottonmouth is from northern Florida. As with the other native penistome, Curacephalus coarctatus, um, Porocephalus crotali is much thicker than RO and has a much more distinct head, head region um, than RO's flattened head. Here you can see some isolated Porocephalus. 
and these have been preserved in alcohol and worms from preserved specimens of all types, including penistomes, often become more opaque and here very white um, when they've been in alcohol or some other fixative. So uh, fresh specimens, the parasites look different than they do in preserved ones. For the entirety of this video, we we're talking about the adult parasites within the definitive host, which are snakes for these penistome species. What we didn't get into was what the larvae look like. And here's an example of a larvae with the four hook-like appendages and the buccal cadre at the anterior portion of the head. So we will create another dissection video where we're looking at larvae within intermediate hosts, such as uh, frogs, toads, lizards, and maybe even cockroaches, because RO does exhibit a three-host life cycle where it gets into a coprophagous invertebrate and then gets into an anurin or a lizard, uh, and then it gets into the snake. So look out for another video where we are dissecting maybe a frog or a toad, and we are examining where the larvae are, typically throughout the viscera, um, and we'll show you just how big they are, and you can usually see them under a dissecting scope. So invasive penistomes, including RO, are a really important conservation threat and a growing conservation threat. And so we really encourage people uh, from different parts of the country to think about looking for these. And roadkill snakes uh, can offer a good opportunity to see if you have penistome in your area and to determine what they are. And if you have any questions, um, you can reach us uh, through email and we'll post our email address. And the larger collaboration group that we formed in May 2022 is called SLAM, so Snake Lungworm Alliance and Monitoring. So you can get in touch with us through Twitter and we'll also have our emails posted here. Um, and just let us know what you're finding and if you need any supplies, advice, or protocols to dissect snakes yourselves or take a look at their feces because the penistome eggs are passed with the feces. So stay in touch and thank you so much for watching.